on to our main event, National Chief Sean Atlio. Uh, National Chief Atlio is a hereditary chief from the um, Ahuset First Nation. In July 2009, he was elected to a three-year mandate as National Chief to the Assembly of First Nations. Prior to assuming this mandate, National Chief Atlio secured two terms as Regional Chief of the BC AFN. In March 2005, an historic leadership accord was signed overcoming decades of discord among First Nations leadership in British Columbia. Um, National Chief Atlio was absolutely instrumental in, in bringing this about. Um, every, um, occasionally, in a, in a generation, we have a leader who has the ability to bring um, and affect real change both to uh, his community and to the wider community. And I think that, uh, National Chief Atlio is, is just such a leader, and in fact, we're very privileged to have him here tonight. Uh, I'm sure that if you don't already believe that to be the case, you'll, you'll probably uh, believe that to be the case after you've heard him speak tonight. Uh, in 2008, his commitment to education was recognized in his appointment as Chancellor of Vancouver Island University, becoming BC's first Indigenous University Chancellor. National Chief Atlio credits much of his support of his support and strength to his partner of 24 years, Nancy, and their two adult children, Tyson and Tara. Traditional teachings have guided National Chief Atlio to serve First Nations as a leader, facilitator, mediator, planner, and teacher. And by serving his community in this fashion, he does a service to us all. Now this is the tricky part, for me anyway. Uh, to National Chief Atlio, we deeply appreciate you being here, and we say to you, in the new Chunnala language, and I apologize if I've mispronounced it, Kliko Kliko Machinowicz. Machinowicz. Uh, in the Cree language, traditional to many of those in the, in the Treaty 6 territory, I say Tunsi Tunsi, and I hope I haven't mispronounced that. Tunse? Oh, Tunse. Okay. <laughs> Now, if you were asking me to speak Hindi, not a problem. <laughs> it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome and present National Chief Sean Atlio. Thank you uh, so much, and um, really appreciate the, uh, the effort to speak um, my language. It, uh, it means a tremendous amount, in fact. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. And I also want to, um, I know we're all appreciative of, uh, to, uh, to say thank you as well. Um, for, the, for the prayer, and um, the warm welcome, and, and uh, the good words especially about how we carry ourselves. And I know that you must by now be well known as the grandparents of Michael, the basketball champion. Very inspiring, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm so appreciative um, to have been invited this evening and uh, to begin in such a manner. We just finished a, a beautiful meal and I wanna, I wanna recognize and thank uh, the university as well to the president-elect. Uh, it was important leadership that the president is demonstrating by being here and at the end of the meal I says, okay, I'm only having dessert if you show the way. <laughs> and she did, thank you. It was <laughs> delicious. You have yourself a good president coming in here. So, And, um, and also just the fact that we're gathered here um, with indigenous uh, learners and uh, being supported by faculty that it's so clear uh, the students have a, a deep care and appreciation for you and as well for the university leadership that uh, you've opened up this space and I want to join in, in the acknowledgement um, of those who make this uh, fourth annual Gertler um, lecture, family lecture in law um, possible and uh, so thank you so much uh, for the invitation to be here and our good conversation that we had over our meal. That's How is that for a, a ringtone? Sit yaksa in chat, I am a in chat. Histak shit la hoset, 
new channel that lockish beat my ass. I am a inchat. If you haven't seen the little sign <laughs> behind you, yes, that's my name. It is a little embarrassing. <laughs> but since you've put it up there so prominently, <laughs> might I add then that I would share the essence of that name, which I'm honored to carry. It uh, goes back seven generations in my, in my family, as was said in the introduction. I, I was uh, born into, and it's something that, uh, in fact, by and law contravenes our own internal laws is to talk about yourself in that manner, that I come from a hereditary family. And the, the, the name Ah Inchat, it means everyone depends on you. And it's, it's a name that really reflects that notion of us uh, being sovereign as individuals, that we have a responsibility, that we must depend on first ourselves, and then recognize the need to, to uh, rely on each other. And it becomes about relationships between and amongst uh, each other, and with the living world around us, which the elders are always so encouraging us to remember uh, those interrelationships. And uh, so that's where that name comes from. And I proudly carry it today and it looks really nice in the heart. <laughs> so soon after uh, Valentine's Day. <laughs> and Elder as well, your, um, your, your teachings here, Kichi Manito, the way in which you began this evening, that it's always about giving and expressing gratitude for life. My late grandfather, I, it, it's like I'm listening to him when I hear you speak, would uh, remind me to have two glasses of water wake, when you wake up, grandson. Remember where you come from, where life comes from. And always be expressing gratitude. And in fact, the historians and the academics call our people the Waukeshaan people because we are constantly saying, Waukesh, Waukesh, Hatwea. It's the same principle, giving appreciation to the creator, the one who made everything. And we have different ways to talk about the creator. Hatwea is one. It's now also translated as a plural of, of, uh, for chiefs because the leaders are responsible for caring for the, the sacred work and must do so by going to the creator, supported and led and directed by the people. And then there's another word that we use in our, in our language. We use nas as well. The third one that we use, it, it resonates so deeply with me as I look at the, at the youngest uh, audience member at the back, and it's kwa uts. Kwa uts can be used in two ways. It's grandchild, it's the young ones, and it's the creator. And it, it's translated in some respects as the owner of reality. And so in our ceremonies, which we do, we have different ceremonies, as was said here, all throughout our respective territories. And for us, we have this ceremony. We go to the owner of reality so that we can have support to understand the reality of life. This is what you students are engaged in here is to engage in the reality that we're all faced with. And I'm excited for you, and I'm thankful for where you are, and I'm very thankful for the university for opening up space like this, including conversations the likes of which we have the chance to engage in here at this lecture. If it's beginning to come forward, I really do feel excited. I do feel that this is a time in history that perhaps we're at a tipping point. The kinds of conversations that are happening now we're not always happening over the course of, of recent history, particularly in the manner in which they seem to be now. That maybe there's a shift in the relationship in, between First Nations and all Canadians. In some respects, possibly a, a moment of reckoning, where once, as we were talking about over dinner, back in the, in the late 60s, it was described as the Indian problem, alas, is still with us. A man by the name of Trudeau uttering words to that effect. And so, we still have this, this notion of turning this on its head, and we talk about First Nations potential. And here is the notion of inclusion, that idea that um, if we include one another, then we can understand each other better. And uh, this will lead to better and, and, and strengthened relationships. And uh, so I, I really appreciate uh, all those who've made this evening possible. Less than a month ago, as we were talking about over dinner as well, um, on January 24th, over 800 chiefs, youth, and elders gathered in Ottawa for the First Nations Crown Gathering. This meeting between nations, between chiefs, the Prime Minister, and members of Cabinet and the Governor General was an important step towards resetting the relationship, an effort that has been um, being pursued by our leaders for so long. I have been 
um, privilege to be able to learn from and be mentored by, although he doesn't know that maybe that's the case, by your own Sagage Henderson. And Sagage, um, I'm very thankful. Um, this is not easy work. This is a difficult road for us to be undertaking. And it is important to recognize, support, and uphold those who've been leading the way. People like uh, Don Worm, uh, also uh, acknowledged and respected uh, right across this country for incredible work. In, in many respects, these people are blazing paths before, for us and for us. And uh, interacting um, in a world that has not always been kind nor open to Indigenous perspective or an Indigenous worldview. And so I'm very thankful, as I said, that, that the learners here, that you're taking and you're expressing the courage by engaging in an opportunity. You will be the, uh, the real game changers, in my personal opinion. You will be the ones who can take us to that next level. And so this meeting that we'd had most recently, it's one that is an effort, as I'd learned from the people, the likes of Sagage, that we would return to the original relationship upon which this very country was founded, mutual recognition, mutual respect. This year is going to be such an important year, especially here in Saskatchewan. I was talking to Chief uh, Darcy Bear, Whitecap First Nation. He says, you know, there was information in a museum in Ontario that says our own ancestors were not only participants but decorated in the War of 1812. Of course, the incoming president from the United States, we had this discussion even ever so briefly. But slowly this history is bubbling to the surface. And perhaps it's the right time because now there can be maybe an, a, a, an enhanced willingness to see this truth that is now beginning to surface. That the Dakota people and Nakota people, that the Mohawks, that other nations fought shoulder to shoulder with others, not as subjects, but as allies. And indeed, blood was shed, lives were lost. And of course, treaties were forged. And at this gathering on the 24th of last month, the Governor General has an important role to play representing the Crown, helped reflect back this moment, 200 year anniversary of the War of 1812, and that Canada has now inherited as a successor state is the way it's articulated the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Canada inherits an obligation, a responsibility to give effect to those treaty relationships. And I know that there was even a class uh, earlier this evening, I, I was uh, made to understand on international law and international legal issues. And so it is, our Indigenous people and leaders are forging this at every single level in the communities, here nationally and internationally at uh, the United Nations as well. There's lots of important work going at the, at the uh, Organization of American States. And so this is about together focusing on, on building our individual and determining where it is that the collective connects to set the stage for jointly designing approaches to our challenges and to address priority areas. That was the vision that the ancestors have provided all of us when they forged treaties. As is always so famously said, and I heard it earlier today, we are all treaty people, meaning it's not just the First Nations who are participant of treaties, and Saskatchewan is recognized as a leader across the whole country for a treaty curriculum that helps bring that sentiment forward. That whether you're a newcomer to this land or you've been here for many generations, that you are a part of the treaty relationship, and as such that you then have responsibilities to give effect to the treaty. And so as is often, um, is, is often talked about, has been how long this relationship has been, has been um, so badly broken, and for how long a broken system has been in place. This can be seen most poignantly in the living conditions in so many of our communities. And perhaps the other side of the new technology, which brings with it challenges. We saw, for many Canadians, the first time was brought the story of Attawapiskat into their homes. They know that right now, as we are here together, that there's a three-year-old in one of those little shacks in Attawapiskat when the temperatures are plunging. This is, is often said in a country that often ranks in the top 10. And we know that as the story unfolds, that Canadians, though, when they begin to understand and drill deep into these issues and begin to understand the roots of them and where they've come from, there seems to be a, a sense and a shift in the conversation to accept a shared responsibility. In the last two plus years, it's incredible the number of Canadians who very often have their attention in South America or, or Africa deploying clean drinking water or building schools and homes 
Some of those very same people are joining the ranks of Homes on Homes. My, my wife sent me after him for perhaps some obvious reasons. Now I'm talking about his carpentry skills. That's what I was talking about mostly. She says, we need to get champions who are influencers in the mainstream community to join us in this effort to help them understand, to bring their influence, to bring their, their passion to see transformation happen around the world just like you do in Africa, just like you do in South America. Let's bring these relationships closer right here in, 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 uh, in our own backyard in Canada. We were talking earlier about Paul Martin, whom, by the way, Jeffrey Kopanis used to work directly with the Prime Minister. He gets, probably gets angry with me for mentioning these things. He's but 33 years old. And he's got to well over a decade plus experience at the highest levels in this country. And he worked right directly there with, with the former Prime Minister. And we know that the Prime Minister was in office and he brought the passion to these issues. And now, now on his own, with his own wealth that he's generated, he's bringing that passion to communities in the area of education. And there's a pattern that's here and I look for patterns, I come from the ocean. You know that uh, where there's one fish jumping, there must be others behind it somewhere. And it feels like something's happening. And it is, in my view, very exciting. And so our work toward change to transform the relationship, it is about working together to find solutions. That's what the outgoing Auditor General said, Sheila Fraser, after 32 au audits covering 10 years. She said the only way forward is for First Nations and the government to jointly work together. It's also what the UN Declaration says we must do, First Nations working with the Crown. It's also what the original treaties have always said, that we must be full partners. So this is what the effort has always been about. It certainly is, in my case, personally. While I come from a territory and I carry a name, in the role that I have with the Assembly of First Nations, I am not the holder of a treaty. The AFN is not the signatory to treaties. We, did not, we do not hold Aboriginal title and rights that rightfully belongs to the Indigenous peoples. It belongs to those who you put in place as leaders to give effect to the rights that you have, to your treaties. My role has been to, to, to uh, provide every opportunity to open doors or, as I said, kick them open, whatever the case may be, to encourage for that real nation-to-nation -nation relationship. So it's about a collective future then, not just the, the future of, of First Nations, where we share an understanding of the need for First Nations to be full participants in designing a collective future for our communities and, in fact, the country as a whole. Now, while we as First Nations, we have our, our own path, there's over 50 languages, and we may differ in, in different ways, we also all collectively strive to succeed and achieve a better day. We want to see our communities healthy and thriving, and our families healthy and thriving. Just as our ancestors came together, newcomers and First Nations alike with a common vision, based on mutual respect, understanding, and success, so too today we must come together and work together for, to achieve a better day for, for all of our peoples. So this, uh, this conversation, as you're hearing, is about resetting the relationship and realizing lasting change. And I'm really talking about realizing the dreams of, of all of our ancestors. These are not dreams that are beyond our grasp, I submit. They're not dreams of a perfect world. Our stories remind us. They ask us to heed caution that there is much danger in the world. We all have those stories. But it is certainly a dream of a better world. It's a dream of a great nation. It's a dream of harmony, of mutual respect, of mutual strength and prosperity. And the reality is that we do have a lot of work to do. This dream I speak of has not been the experience and the reality of Indigenous peoples in this country. Since contact, in fact, there's been a constant and aggressive erosion of First Nations institutions, laws, economies, and ways of life. When I listen to you, Elder, I think about the words of uh, Black Elk, who suggested that the sole purpose, in fact, of the whole universe is relationality. That it is our responsibility as people, as humans, to uphold, to create, and maintain relationships. And I always think about the work of the ancestors during the days of, of making of treaty, that this was what was in the heart when those ceremonies were done at that time. So in order to reset this relationship and unlock the full potential of First Nations, it's also about us collectively severing the shackles of 
paternalism and replacing the Indian Act and its bloated administrative organization with modern intergovernmental relationships. The imposition and continued enforcement of the Indian Act has been one of the most egregious aff affronts to this relationship between Canada and First Nations. And we have much more consensus here than pe people perhaps would, uh, would suggest around this issue. At the gathering itself, uh, both the Prime Minister and myself, he talked about it was a, a stump with deep roots and if we just pulled it out, it would create a hole. And then I got up a few minutes later and I said, there's a boulder in the middle of the road and it's impeding our progress. So you see, we have work to do. We have work to do to understand exactly what we're talking about. What, what was appreciated, though, was that he, didn't, he said, we don't have a grand scheme as government to replace the Indian Act. It's an important first step because there have been efforts in the past. First Nations have fought uh, against that. Why? Because the principles that I've been talking about, we must be full partners in designing the way forward. It has to be understood that some First Nations in this country are already beyond the Indian Act. They've negotiated their way out of the Indian Act. But whether you've just forged a new agreement in the Yukon and it was 20 years in the making and you had a battery, Mr. Worm, of lawyers, dotting I's and crossing T's, those nations are still saying that the spirit and intent of those agreements that were concluded five years ago are not being upheld. It's the same language you hear from the Mi'kmaq people in the Atlantic whose treaty is 267 years old. So there's a pattern here. The notion of this relationship being something that we move towards, but that we give full effect to. And also recognizing that we don't leave governments alone to be solely responsible for upholding these relationships. This is something that I feel strongly that institutions uh, like this um, academic leadership can play a central role in not only understanding this, this, uh, um, this reality that we've all inherited, but suggesting a, a better and a new way forward. So there is, in many respects, no disagreement about getting rid of the Indian Act. Rather, what we just haven't had is the real opportunity and ability for First Nations governments and the Crown to set the options and a time frame for transition. And so again, and I'll keep emphasizing this, it's not an easy task. Not least of these barriers is the creation and the perpetuation of mechanisms to enforce that very act. That, in addition to layer upon layer of bureaucratic interference and control, is piled upon our people and, and certainly it pins us collectively down. So this pattern, in, in, in addition to the, the resources that, that support it, is completely wrong. First Nations have, have been frozen at 2% growth for 15 years now. And it's, it's only at this moment that through work like the uh, panel report on education recently released that uh, Canadians are understanding that First Nations are the only segment of the Canadian population without a statutory guarantee for education. The federal government c commits transfers, and they did again in this last election, at 6% for education and health to the provinces. First Nations have been capped since 1996. The Auditor General made it very clear, this deep gap that exists in education, two to $7,000 per child in some cases, in some jurisdictions of the country. And the Auditor General said the gap is growing, it's getting worse. And remember, she covered 10 years, her, her audits, two different political uh, uh, institutions and, and realities. And so this isn't about finger pointing and, and, uh, and uh, handing out uh, blame. It's about facing up to uh, the reality that, that, we're, that we're faced, including the fact that of the wealth that's denied our peoples, that comes from the riches of our territories. I hear the leaders here in uh, Saskatchewan talk about the Natural Resource Transfer Act and uh, the delegation of, of authority by the federal crown partner on, on resources in, uh, in provinces. So we have some challenges then because treaties by their very nature we're also economic, and the economic foundation of the relationship has to be addressed. So this is about transforming the entire situation and looking to First Nations themselves to blaze the trail forward, and many of them, in fact, are. The Dakota white cap people, Chief Darcy Bear, what an incredible example of, um, of good governance in, in, in his community and is, in fact, an economic driver that is benefiting not just his community but the entire province. And this is the sort of potential that, that I suggest that, that we are in the middle of. 
Canada did endorse the, the declaration I've been speaking to, and it was an important endorsement. It does explicitly compel us to work together in mutual respect and partnership. And it means, it means recognizing First Nations as governments, and it means upholding treaties and respecting fully our Thailand rights. The declaration compels both states and indigenous peoples to work together in mutual partnership and respect. And it sets out the standard, and it's something we talked about at dinner, it sets out the standard of free, prior, and informed consent. And that, that means just what it says, that First Nations, that we must be full partners in designing a way forward. And um, I keep being asked this question, and uh, perhaps I'll leave this for the legal scholars to debate further. But at Leo, does that mean a veto? It means what it means, free, prior, and informed consent. That's what the ancestors said, that we must be, that must be in place, that we must have a shared notion of the vision for the future in our economies, in education, in health, and child welfare. And on the one hand, as we do pursue a, a transformed relationship, make no mistake that we will stand firm as we are in federal court just this week, standing shoulder to shoulder with the Child and Family Caring Society, Cindy Blackstock, one of my personal heroes, and say, you know what, we're going to stand up for the kids when it comes to child welfare. And there were hundreds of them on Parliament Hill on Valentine's Day saying, have a heart for First Nations. The children, the children are stepping forward and speaking out. These are non-Indigenous children from schools in the city saying, you know what, my Canada includes a relationship with First Nations. That's, what, that's the sort of messages that they were bringing forward. So this notion of uh, um, Canada and other states saying, that they want to constrict the standard of free prior and informed consent, saying it's an impossible threshold, too close to a veto and therefore unacceptable. But, you know, this concept can, can work. It's a standard that establishes the requirement for an agreement-based approach to development. In areas like energy, where we lurch from conflict to conflict, major resource development, our elders are reminding us about that relationship with the earth around us. And so it is that uh, we now see the governments at the federal and provincial level starting to talk about energy. I've traveled to so many communities, been to those communities in places like northern Manitoba, where communities have been moved three times in 100 years from their traditional territories from where they always were, so that their territories could be flooded, hydro development developed, and power sent to the cities in the south and sometimes sold stateside, while those very same communities are on, on diesel fuel. We don't necessarily have a very coherent, well, we don't have an energy strategy or a vision for issues like energy or major resource development in this country. That's where I feel so strongly that it is our time as Indigenous people to step into the obligations and responsibility that we have to shape a future based on the recognition of our rights, recognition and implementation, of our treaties, and also the vision that the ancestors left us about a relationship with the environment that returns us to seeking balance and harmony. Does this have to be something that goes against development or is anti-development or is not about prosperity? Well, quite the contrary. If we were to close the education and the employment gap for First Nations, in one generation this would result, the economists say, and we're engaging them more and more to help bring this conversation to an economic perspective as well, it would result in 400 billion in additional output to Canada's GDP in one generation. And savings in government expenditures of 115 billion in one generation. Those are tremendous returns for investment that if we choose to, especially now, Saskatchewan, you guys are producing, like this, the population of Indigenous peoples right here, it's exploding. <laughs> the nation is rebuilding at a rapid pace. I can say that about my own village too. Back home, we have a great population explosion and we can see that if we move quickly to support, especially the young people, have them spend time with the elders and learn those teachings so that they can come to schools like this and have the institution support them as well. But I am concerned, very much so, for those kids that are in especially grade 11 and 12 right now. Or what about those ones that haven't had the opportunity to be supported in literacy at the age of three? Or what about supporting the parents to make sure that they they have proper childcare to be able to support the schooling or access to clean drinking water, a safe place to be at home. 
There are many factors that are interrelated here. So the effort on the 24th was about pursuing new fiscal relationship with the Crown to say we've got to transform this. Lurching from year to year makes no sense. The Auditor General even said, do you know with the federal government we can't, we can't understand how it is they decide what kinds of resources are spent in areas like education. She used the term completely, it's arbitrary, quote unquote. It makes no sense that we don't go back to the notion that the leaders in, in Canada and for First Nations have been driving since the 70s. It makes sense that First Nations control education, that they work with the elders to design the very best responses. So this has been a, a constant uh, press on, on, on behalf of our people. And we're hopeful that Canadians will, will join us in recognizing that First Nations culture and history and language, our stories, this is a rich part of the cultural heritage, we would hope, of this country. And that perhaps it's time that it's embraced in that manner. So we do have this, this journey that we're all on. And there may be different approaches, and they all must be supported. Especially in, in the work that I do with the Assembly of First Nations, to be careful that we don't repeat that which we've had done to us. Suggest impose top-down or unilateral or one-size-fits-all solutions. That is not, not and has never been the way of First Nations or of Indigenous peoples. That the Indigenous peoples of this land, First Nations and Inuit and Métis, be supported to design their own way forward. This would give effect to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This would uphold the spirit of the apology that I sat and listened to with my late grandmother back in 2008. That that system should never have been set up and it must never happen again. So ultimately it, it is the pursuit of, of self-determination and, and a clear respectful partnership with Canada. So the outcomes that I've been alluding to, the need for new fiscal relationships, not just in education, child welfare, in health, long-term, sustainable, fair, at minimum equitable, but we would argue we have catch-up to make. The challenge that we find ourselves in is if there's, if there's funding for maybe five or six schools that will see an announcement and somehow it, it appears everything's okay. We need 60 schools right now, and I've been to these communities. We have young people like the late Shannon Kustachin leading the way. Shannon's dream has become well known, not just nationally, but internationally. C confirming what I believe, and that is that our young people, uh, who we often say are the leaders of tomorrow, are leading the way right now. They're leading the way today. The 24th was as well, and the Crown expressed a, uh, an openness to work with First Nations to respect the spirit and intent of our treaty relationships and advance approaches to treaty implementation. This is what I've heard so often and so many times that, that First Nations are looking for an opportunity to see the treaties, the honor, the spirit and intent of the treaties honored. To reform comprehensive claims policies. This policy dates back to 1986. Negotiations across the country are languishing by and large, by and large because the policy is based on a, a policy of denial and extinguishment, not recognition and affirmation. A simple example for me that not being a legal scholar. When I was home and we were engaged in a fishing case to prove that our people had always fished and that we have the right to, to fish and to sell those fish. We were in court and the court came to my village and I was sitting with regalia in front of my people and the Crown's lawyer argued that you as an Ahauset, you as a New Channel, you peoples, you don't exist as a peoples. So we begin this conversation knowing that there is a basic principle of denial of us as peoples. Quite contrary to what it was that the ancestors, our collective ancestors, described during the time of treaty making, that we indeed are peoples. I think there's been important uh, contributions by authors like David Hackett Fisher in Champlain's Dream, or John Ralston Saul, or my dad, or Sagage. I mean, it, it, it goes without saying that we, the indigenous scholars and, and uh, writers that are emerging are having an incredible impact, and we're talking about the role of the artist community as well, opening up the heart and the space for new understandings to ensue, that we would be ready to understand and think differently about one another. I often feel like the work of the artist community can do more in, 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 a, in one expression, an artistic expression that, that we could do in, in, in words otherwise, or in our work, or in meetings. I hold a lot of, of hope for, for, for the leadership amongst the artist communities. And that these were some of the outcomes of this discussion, was the need to reform policies like the negotiation policy, 
No wonder it, places like BC has accrued over 300 million in negotiation debt. No wonder the Hulkaminum are taking Canada's negotiation policy to the Inter-American um, Court. That's what it's called, the Inter-American Commission. No wonder our people are, are making sure to bring these messages out to the international community. And speaking of speaking in Hindi, I was thinking about my trip to India. That uh, the, I was invited there to walk with the Adivasi, what they called uh, the, the, um, the landless poor. 24,000 people. And they represented, they said, 80 million. So we know that there's, there's a global movement um, afoot that we're a part of as well. That what happens here in Canada is going to be watched and is going to be important. And I believe strongly that there's every reason why Canada can show the way. And I do look forward to return trips back, but I was just sharing over dinner that I gave a speech to these 24,000 and they were sitting and I said, I told a story about Columbus that we're all very aware, well aware of, so I said, so you see, you're the real Indians. It was the only laugh I got. <laughs> and uh, I'm talking about the, the various barriers, but I, I wanted to, uh, and, and economics, there's an, there's an openness on the part of the Crown to deal with economics, but I, I did want to, to uh, finish the sort of short list of areas that are all cross-cutting. You can't disconnect one from the other. Treaties is as to uh, addressing their uh, denial policy as is to specific areas like education. I feel, I feel so strongly, and it's something my late grandmother left me with, was the notion that education is, the, is really the tool to focus on. And it's perhaps the door that we want to walk through so that we can have the discussion about the issues around water and around child welfare, around how it is to support families in our more broad relationship. Because it isn't, isn't it the deep misunderstanding that's been driven and the wedge that's been driven between us that's created the situation that we're in? And isn't it education, not only to support our young people to be anchored in who they are, and to ask institutions of higher learning to say, don't ask our, our young people to leave their identity, their language and culture at the door. Invite that in, because it will enrich this whole country. It will enrich the learning experience. And I believe institutions are moving away from the notion of just inculcating pouring knowledge into the minds of learners and then sending them out into the world. We're shifting from that industrial model of, of development of people as human capital for a market economy and bringing in some balance with the notion that we are supporting actors in a more civil society. And that it requires for the learners to bring all of themselves as well into the learn learning environment. This has been an important shift, I, I believe, has, has happened. And so I, I just want to reiterate how strongly I feel that education at every level, not only the education of our learners, but to see the academic leadership reach out to Canadians and support them, grab them by, grab them by the hand, especially their kids, their kids who are, who are growing up in the school systems, thankfully in, in jurisdictions like this where they're learning about this, because that's the, where the change will really come from. It wasn't very many years ago, I was down at Stanford at an executive management course, learning, learning, um, well, about finance, which I'm not very good at. And the instructor, who I'm sure has, has developed many MBAs over the course of his life, said issues of social and economic justice do not belong in the market economy. And that wasn't very long ago, maybe 15 years ago. And so we have the conditions, and we have the challenges, and we have the conflicts that exist, and institutions of higher learning are at a central place to help support and facilitate transformation. So that it is up to all of us to drive the commitment and realize the action that's required. I really do feel that we need now the energy, the ideas, and most importantly, the commitment of everyone to achieve the change, not in a generation, but now. That the pain and suffering of our young people, that we commit, that it ends now. This is the generation that we can, that they will look back on and say, they arrived at a time when they knew what needed to be done and they stepped forward and they facilitated the kind of change that's required. I'm hoping it's that moment of reckoning because we want nothing more, nothing less than the ability to make decisions that affect our lives, our lands, our nations, and to take responsibility for those decisions. Returning to the vision of our ancestors, I can see a future based on mutual respect, on support and inclusion. This means inclusion of our people in the creation of policies laws and decisions that impact our lives. It means inclusion and sharing in the benefits for any and all development in our territories 
and in the creation of our own local economies. There are many who are already on this path. Some of these very same nations are the ones behind the drive for excellent education systems that have language and culture at the center. And in their wake, they're rebuilding wholeness, evidenced through their increasing graduation rates, improved community health, and families who begin to have hope. Hope that's grounded in the pride of their identity and the opportunity driven by their nation taking responsibility. So I can say with certainty that this is not only possible, that in fact the work is, is well underway. The challenge that I felt coming into this work is that we had to work to increase the rate and the pace of change. That we cannot and must not wait, as I've said here, we cannot afford to lose another generation. A collective commitment to understand these issues may be the most important we can all agree is needed first and the, the place for all of us to begin. This is about listening and learning, about together knowing that we can turn the tide to push this tipping point to the kind of real transformation. But it means also that we have to push harder. It's our time to press forward, to have the challenging conversations, not to shy away from the difficult conversations, but to go directly to them to go to the reality that we all face, to engage with each other openly and honestly. It's our time to come together to support one another. This is what the, the National Panel on Education helps us to understand. The difference between this report and many other reports is, as you know, governments will commission reports, but their practice is to bring them internal, do their own internal analysis, and then pick and choose, and then unilaterally determine the outcomes. My interest, is, I have a facilitative background, I believe in a nation-to-nation -nation relationship was to ask for this panel to be transparent for the report, not just to come to government, to put, put it out there. Now our people are reviewing it, but so are they. This report says we need urgent action right now. Relief for communities is required immediately. Of course, we've known this, but to have it jointly understood was the real objective. And also this, this, this uh, report is saying we must jointly design education. The fact that there's a sense of shared urgency, I hope, changes this from, from talk to action, because that's what's so deeply frustrating. I would be six and a half feet tall standing on all the education reports that have been written since the early 70s. My father reminds me, he says, Dad, he says son, you know, the first education policy statement was made in the 1600s when, when uh, a religious leader commented that out of 100 Indian kids, they could only educate one. Only one of them would receive the education. Go forward to the 1960s and the Hawthorne Report didn't talk about an education success rate, talked about a failure rate of 95% not that long ago. It was the, it was the passion of our, our leaders who pushed Indian control of Indian education. Success rates shot up like they never had before and have hovered at around the same rates. Still not where we want them, around 50%. We have more post-secondary graduates now than we have ever had in history. And as Chancellor of Vancouver Island University, I got to convene over my daughter's Bachelor's of Business Administration graduation ceremony last week. She's really tall. <laughs> I gave her a big hug. I'm, so, I'm a proud dad. So we see the successes that are happening as well. And it is about making this work much more transparent and making sure that it is driven up to our people, by our people, driven by our leaders. I'm very hopeful that the educators will also be expressing how they feel about the changes that are required. The report said we don't have an education system really for First Nations learners. There isn't really a system that's set up. So this will, will require us to be organized, but also we're going to be compelling the government to match that need with the important resources that, to build our institutions. And so my role is really facilitative. It's to hope that we can maintain this momentum, but to reach out to say, we need help maintaining the momentum. And it's about saying to ourselves that the status quo, that which our kids face right now, that it's unacceptable. And that change will happen because they deserve it and that's the bottom line. And when I say we, I am meaning all of us. The president uh, was saying we and she wasn't sure if it was her former institution or a new institution. When I say we, I am saying it is all of us that must be involved in driving change. That includes new, new, new economies and new opportunities that are consistent with the treaties, consistent with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This is about pulling together to make the change that our kids, especially right now, need. 
and we'll need to rely on your expertise, your energy. And yes, the students, I am looking directly at you. For with the power of an education, as Spider-Man was told, comes great responsibility. <laughs> and I know that uh, our future is in good hands. And I know that the, uh, the leadership um, amongst the students is already making um, great inroads to raising the consciousness and awareness um, amongst Canadians. And it's through all of these dedicated efforts, through the quiet and strong support and guidance of the elders, the determination and energy of the youthful leadership among students, not all students are young, many, re many um, returning to, uh, to learning later on in life. And it's through all of these efforts that uh, I am convinced that, uh, that we will succeed. I know I certainly will be unwavering in honor of my late grandmother, who with tears in her eyes sat at that apology and said they're just beginning to see us. Grandson, she said, I've been a fighter all my life. She was a tiny lady, even shorter than me. I was a fighter all my life. 17 kids, I raised all my kids to be fighters. You fight your fight with education now, grandson. You fight your fight with education. I always remember those words and that encouragement, and I know that amongst uh, my generation, we're not the first to hear that. And I'm very thankful for her uh, for encouragement and support. And she also brought with her and uh, left me with the notion of reconciliation, about relationships and about healing. Many important uh, messages that, that she brought forward. So there is, uh, to conclude, there is no easy way forward. As much as it drove me nuts trying to finish Algebra 11 when I didn't the first time around and I said, Dad, there must be an easy way. No, son, there's the hard way or the harder way. The harder way is if we continue on a path that's separate. The harder way is if we don't give 100% of ourselves to giving effect to the collective vision that is so beautiful that we've been left by our collective ancestors. And it will be much more difficult if we don't engage in, in this work. It will be tough as it is, but I have great hope that this is the moment when we can see the change we deeply desire. Very honored to have been invited. Thank you so much to share a few words here this evening.